fine. I'm okay with the events that are unfolding currently. Oh no. Goddamn budget airlines. Like a regular Barracuda, but only more acidic. What's up, everybody? Today we're looking at Uncharted 3, Drake's Deception, released in 2011 for the PlayStation 3. Right out of the gate, the graphics look great. This has to be one of the top 10 best looking PlayStation 3 games. It's just not stable. What the fuck? In rather stark contrast to the rest of the game, there are some backgrounds that look god awful. I don't know what happened to Elena, but she appears to have come down with a rather serious case of funny face. This is why we can't have nice things. As for gameplay, the concept is identical to the last two games with the addition of swimming, which was nice. They've also included these wide panoramic shots where you won't realize it, but you're still playing. Oh, oh hey, I can move. One thing is certain for me is that the gunplay felt worse from the second game as it didn't really have the same level of polish. Oh, and here's a terrible idea. Let's add buoyancy in various levels, which makes aiming nearly impossible in an area where we crank up the difficulty. Fuck this shit, I'm out. Okay, picture this. You just beat the game. You think, hey, the last two games had awesome bonus menus. They increase the replayability and are a ton of fun. Literally. Hmm, that's weird. They didn't include it this time. <clears throat> you done goof, Naughty Dog. Rumor has it the reason they didn't include a bonus menu this time was due to the same stability issues I mentioned earlier. Back in the day, you would have had the multiplayer to round out the value of the game, but for me, this is a deal breaker. For weapons, the game's pretty similar to the last two. The usual suspects show up with a new scope revolver, a light machine gun, and a bolt action rifle. The bolt action rifle fires faster than the SVD, which makes no goddamn sense. I do enjoy the revolver, there's nothing like running up to an enemy and rapidly emptying it in their face. Unfortunately, the enemies this time around are a lot worse. They definitely dumbed things down and their variety suffered as well. They also included a new brute enemy, which usually results in a desperate fistfight. There is a little trick though if you want to skip it. Oh, and can't forget there's spiders. Some would argue too many spiders. I think it would have been great to have a bonus menu mod where they turn them into little hamsters. That shit would have been hilarious watching Nate getting swarmed by cute little furballs. Without getting into spoilers, the game's focus is on locating a treasure hidden by Sir Francis Drake in the Middle East. The game's plot overall is okay, it's just janky, and doesn't have the same pacing as the previous games. When you look at the game in hindsight, it's very obvious Naughty Dog put a focus on the setting and the levels in which you play in versus the plot, and this never works when you're trying to do a narrative story. I would argue that the plot even feels unfinished, and this has to be my least favorite in the entire series. Alrighty then, let's get into spoilers. If you want to avoid them, please jump to the timestamp above. The game opens two years later in a London pub. Nate and Sully enter to sell Nate's ring to a man named Talbot. Just before they seal the deal, Nate shuts down the transaction as the cash is fake, which erupts into a massive fistfight. <laughs> After the brawl concludes, we see Nate and Sully are captured by a thug named Cutter. A car rolls up and our main villain emerges, Marlow. As a villain, I can't tell you how disappointing she is. It feels like she's more of a competitor than an actual villain. Anyway, Marlo takes Nate's ring, and things go south when Cutter shoots both of our heroes. I hate the fact they tried to do this. I mean, you know they're going to live. Why even do this in the opening act of the game? It feels like a B-movie idea. No, not that B-movie. We then flash back 20 years earlier to Columbia, and witness how a teenage Nate obtained his ring. We also find Sully, who is working for Marlo, to retrieve the same ring. After we obtain the ring, we have a bit of shenanigans, and Nate is caught by one of Marlowe's henchmen. Sully intervenes and takes on Nate as his protege. We then return to the present day to see Nate and Sully had faked their deaths as Cutter is a double agent. The three of them then meet up with Chloe and trace Marlowe to an underground library. After a very deus ex machina moment, we retrieve a map of Sir Francis Drake's voyage to Arabia to find the lost city of Iram. We even learn there are clues hidden in France and Syria. Why, you might ask? Because the setting takes a higher precedence than the plot. Nate and Sully travel to France, and Cutter and Chloe travel to Syria. Once Nate and Sully enter a chateau, they locate the first half of the amulet. Before they can depart, they are ambushed by Talbot and forced to give up the amulet. Oh, and there's giant spiders. But wait, there's more. Talbot also sets the chateau on fire. You know what that means, right? Run, bitch! Run! Nate and Sully then meet with Chloe and Cutter in Syria, and learn Marlowe is the head of the same order in which Sir Francis Drake belonged to. A bit later, Cutter is drugged, loses his mind, and nearly kills Nate. The safe word is stop. Luckily, the drug wears off just in time to experience more spiders. Wait. Anywho, they find the other half of the amulet, revealing the next destination is in Yemen. During their escape, Cutter is cornered and loses the other half of the amulet and is forced to jump off a tower where he breaks his legs. Our group manages to escape, and with things getting too real, Chloe and Cutter abandon the quest. Filthy casuals. Right, back on track, Nate and Sully arrive in Yemen and reunite with Elena, who volunteers to help them locate a nearby tomb. 
After a bit of exploration, we find a star map which reveals the location of Iram in the Rubal Kali Desert. Oh, and of course there's the obligatory hordes of spiders. Getting kinda old. Anyways, our heroes go to depart the city, and Nate is shot with a hallucinogenic dart. I hope you packed your bags, cause we're going on a bit of a trip. Unfortunately, Nate is later captured, and we learn Marlowe has accumulated documents on Nate's childhood. It's here we learn Nate is not related to Sir Francis Drake, and simply adopted his last name. Why is this significant, you might ask? It only serves to give the game a title, nothing else. What a waste of a premise, and poorly written narrative. Ugh. Nate then manages to escape and pursues Talbot. Just before Nate can finish Talbot, he is captured by a pirate working for Marlowe. Watch out, watch out, watch out! We later awake to being interrogated by a group of pirates, who reveal they also have Sully captured nearby. Nate escapes and searches the ship graveyard for his mentor. Unfortunately, the pirate lied and we learn Sully is not in his custody. In another deus ex machina moment, the pirates inadvertently sink the ship we are on and Nate washes ashore in Yemen. Later on, Nate rendezvous with Elena and learns that Sully was captured by Marlowe and forced to lead them to the city of Iram. To rescue his friend, Nate then sneaks onto a cargo plane that will be airdropping supplies to Marlowe's convoy. Nate is then discovered and a shootout ensues that destroys the plane. It's annoying how they put the fight sequence together as you can easily get crushed by the sliding boxes. Other than that, this is easily the best part of the game. We free fall for a short bit and latch onto a cargo box where Nate deploys the parachute. It's the perfect way to transition the scene and not turn Nate into a pancake. Nate then wanders the desert, going in circles, until he lucks out and runs into Marlowe's troops. After a few firefights, Nate is rescued by a group led by a man named Salim. Once they reach safety, Salim explains Iram was doomed by King Solomon when he imprisoned a jinn into a vessel and cast it into the city. Salim explains that Marlowe cannot be allowed to reclaim the jinn, or else a great evil will be unleashed upon the world. The two then attack Marlowe's convoy and rescue Sully. Later, Nate and Sully are separated from the group in a sandstorm and somehow stumble upon the entrance to a ram. The two approach a fountain within the city and Nate takes a drink. Next thing we know, Sully has been shot by Talbot in the back. Nate, enraged, gives chase, fighting off Marlowe's men who we can only assume have been possessed by the djinn. These demons are kinda neat, but they're nowhere as cool as the monsters in the first two games. Oh, and later on we find Sully. Yeah, turns out his death was an illusion. They faked his death twice in this game, three times in the series overall. I really can't tell you how much I hate when writers do this. It makes it basically impossible for anyone to become invested in the plot. Moving on, Nate realizes the gin is actually a vessel containing a hallucinogenic that poisoned the water supply of a ram. This was the reason why Sir Francis Drake abandoned the quest for the Atlantis of the Sands, as the djinn would have been too powerful for any mortal to control. Nate and Sally then move on and discover Marlowe's team using a winch to recover the vessel. Nate annihilates the winch, but also destroys the support column which causes the entire city to begin to collapse. During our escape, we arrive at the death of the main villain. Is it amazing? No. She gets pulled into a sinkhole and suffocates. Once again, my expectations were subverted, but it was definitely unsatisfactory. Nate and Sully are then forced to fight Talbot. Usually this is a pretty cool fight, but my battle dropped off pretty quickly. I mean, Talbot literally fell off the map. I swear this game needed more polish. Anyway, after a long struggle, Talbot is shot and falls to his death and our heroes escape. Nate and Sully then return to Yemen, where Sully gives a wedding ring to Nate. Elena then joins them, and with no buildup whatsoever, Nate proposes. Of course, they'll live happily ever after. Like that's ever gonna happen. Somebody. So, in summary, this is an okay game. The plot is mediocre due to a boring villain, and it feels like the story could have used a second draft. Looking at the series overall, this is my least favorite, so I'm gonna have to give it a C. Thank you all for watching. I really appreciate you watching until the end of the video. And lastly, but most importantly, I hope you all have a great day. Well, why did we even bother then? Hold on. Disappointed!